Hello. We want to start. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Um, we, this is actually the, the last lecture of the spring semester, which was a pretty busy semester. So from now on, it's just focusing on final reviews and you know your final presentations and all that. <laughs> um, no, I think this is our, our last one. Um, in any case, um, we're super proud and happy to have Kate Baluk, Katarzyna Baluk, with us today. Uh, as you all know, she started working with us last year, and um, she has a quite impressive uh, sort of curriculum and, and background. And I'm going to ask and invite my colleague, um, Great Reed, Professor Great Reed, to introduce Kate today. Thank you. It's my. It's my great pleasure to, to introduce my colleague and now friend, Kate Balug, and to welcome her to FIU. This is her first year, and I really hope that we can, um, that we can open our arms and make her, make her feel like she really is a part of, of our family. So um, she arrived right straight out of her PhD at Harvard and that was, uh, with a dissertation that explored inflatables. But here's the thing. The real question she was asking was uh, questioning the myth that architecture is this kind of enclosed environment that's separate from the, from the world outside. You know, by extension, are we separate from the world outside? And she literally kind of pokes holes in that. So uh, you'll hear more about this. But what I really want you to know is how multifaceted she is. Not only is she a historian and a theorist who seeks out examples from the past to help us move forward into the future, and that's the real value of history. You know, we need, the, we need that equipment from the past. She has a master's in urban planning, so she gets cities, and she really understands the role of buildings in cities and uh, the many roles that buildings can have in making cities really great places to live. And, <laughs> That's not enough. She's got an art practice that goes out into the community and engages people in uh, really thinking about uh, their, their situation in the world. Um, collaborative, sort of collaborative exploration. So, and she's just a lovely person. So you should all go talk to her <laughs> and just enjoy the conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so thank you to the Zoom folks, too. <laughs> Before I say too much, I'm going to ask you to just sit back and watch. Oh, no, my sound got stolen by the Zoom. Go. 
Agency. Go. Ecom. Go. Surgeon. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle Houston, you're go for landing. Over. that last part, right? You've got a bunch of guys here about to turn blue. On July 20th, 1969, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin approached the lunar surface. 650 million people watched on TV nearly simultaneously. In our cosmology, this was the end point of a pursuit as ancient as time. We had finally reached the distant dream. To get there had involved a centuries-old feedback loop between fantasy and scientific inquiry, between inspiration and experimentation. Jules Verne presciently detailed a launch by Cannon from Cape Canaveral in 1865 and introduced into sci-fi an emphasis on science. His calculations for how to launch and orbit the moon take a significant part of the book. Verne's science fiction inspired the science of space travel. The first rocket engineers like Herman Oberth on the right there and Konstantin Tsiolkovsky, who both wrote and conducted pioneering research in rocketry in the 1920s, credit Verne as an inspiration. This quote says it well. Astronautics is unique among all the sciences because it owes its origins to an art form. In this talk today, I will inquire about the tail end of this relationship. What kinds of art forms originated because of astronautics? We know that aeronautics, so air fl airplane flight, had long influenced modern architecture, perhaps most famously in France through Le Corbusier, but also in Germany through the Bauhaus, whose second home was in the same city as the Junkers airplane factory. We know the fascination with space travel in film, fiction, and fashion from the 1920s through the end of the 1960s. But what about architecture after the Bauhaus? Specifically, I'm looking at the use of inflatable structures by young experimental architects working in Western Europe in the late 1960s. I will argue that the proximity to realizing the long desire to reach worlds beyond Earth played a significant role in the use of these forms, and that they, in turn, provided an artistic reflection about what it meant to leave Earth. Two key influences underwrite this talk. In a study of the written and visual work of the 1960s French architectural collective Utopie, Marc de Sauce extrapolated a long-standing link between revolutions and air. From the hospital reform of enlightenment in France in the mid-18th century, to the invention of ballooning just before the French Revolution, to the 1870 Paris Commune, during which balloons facilitated communication and escape. 
As his book's subtitle, Nomadics and Protest in 68, denotes, de Sass recognized the critical engagement of air-supported architecture with the social upheaval of that year. A number of other writers have grappled with air's ontological capacity to shape our world. Inflatables, I will show, used air, that resource so absent in space, to critically and poetically reflect on the existential implications of earthlings leaving the planet. On the other hand, I will argue through their act of world building, inflatables served to inform later imaginaries of outer space habitation in the 1970s, much like the literary genre of sci-fi had done for seeding the idea in the 20th century. And here I follow Elizabeth Gross, an art uh, theorist and philosopher, and her position on art's capacity to make momentary sense out of the chaos of the universe through the body's prior separation from the earth. In the play of art and science then, I position inflatable architecture as an art form that at once questioned the world and produced an alternative. And that alternative we have yet to realize. During the space race, NASA used visual art to sell its effort to the public. My seminar students know this well, we have talked a lot about this. Um, the agency recognized art's capacity to translate human achievement and the emotion of the space launches and massive infrastructure. The Artist in Space program, as it was called, gave invited artists unfettered access to the launch sites on and around launch days. In exchange, they requested access to even the roughest sketches done on site that underscored the artist's role as witnesses. The program focused on painters and illustrators rather than any sculptural or new media. Architecture is also not mentioned. But during the space race, architecture was certainly always in the background. NASA, of course, had to work with designers to produce the necessary structures for their extensive operations. But these did not always reflect the radical activity that was going on inside. Instead, offices like the Manned Spacecraft Center were designed like suburban office parks. And yet, to deliberate future moon habitats, the agency did engage university-level architectural studios, including overseas in the UK, as you see here. And, um, and so the question becomes, how did both types of engagement and the larger space race shape the architectural experiments of the late 1960s? At a lecture in January, we heard uh, all about inflatables from Whitney Moon. So I won't spend too much time reviewing their history. Here I will just retell the story with our particular destination in mind. So what is an inflatable structure? An inflatable structure is a flexible membrane, usually plastic or parachute fabric, something that is impervious to air, with an entrance that can be sealed off, an airlock. It's connected to a fan that blows air in continuously. So the pressure in this type of inflatable is slightly lower than atmospheric pressure. When the airlock is opened, the air blows out and the form begins to deflate, moving visibly. Wind registers on the structure too, as does any interaction with it. A group of people in conversation will heat it up, changing the interior pressure and therefore the form. So it appears lively as a result of this responsiveness to the wind. Unlike a tied off balloon, which is a high pressure system, this low pressure structure will not pop if pierced, since it has this ongoing influx of air. In 1917, the polymath Frederick William Lanchester filed the first patents for inflatable architecture. It was, meant to, it was a proposal for a field hospital. The low pressure inflatable could be erected quickly in distant conditions to provide aid. His primary expertise was in automotive engineering and not surprisingly, aeronautics and powered flight. However, these domes were not built, and the first produced inflatables developed for military needs around World War II. This is a 1943 pontoon bridge that could carry up to four-ton tanks. And during the Cold War, after World War II, Walter Byrd, an engineer, invented the ray dome to house military radar in distant places. And in 1959, in the image you see below and that Whitney talked about at length, Byrd joined the architect Victor Lundy to design the Atoms for Peace pavilion that traveled the world. And this was part of a larger global campaign by President Eisenhower to shift focus toward, away from the kind of military uses of nuclear power toward their potential peaceful uses of nuclear energy 
in order to, though, ultimately grow support for the nuclear program. So inflatables were lightweight, durable, mobile, all things valued by American defense efforts. It would still take until the late 1960s for pneumatics research to become systematized into a recognizable engineering effort. The first pneumatics conference is not until 1967, and we'll come back to that. Um, however, around 1960, the forms begin to come into artistic consciousness. But before we get to them, let's briefly retrace our steps and visit the history of spaceflight up until this moment, 1960. So, we have envisioned space travel since at least the ancient Greeks. Initial attempts to fly tried to mimic the movement of birds. In 1608, the astronomer Johann Kepler penned an imaginary journey to the moon called Somnium. Drugged with opiates, the body was hurled through space by demons, while damp sponges up the nose prevented it from breathing the frigid air. Half a century later, playwright Cyrano de Bergerac's 1657 voyage took him to the moon via many small vials of solar heated dew affixed to his coat. When expanded by the warm sun, he lifted away from Earth. Um, in these two early novels, controlling and managing the body's relationship to air was crucial to access the frontier of human space exploration. This question of controlling the body to ensure survival as it reached new frontiers expanded over the centuries to a desire for larger environmental control. And the dream of leaving Earth then had as much to do with the study of the alternative landing places as it did with learning to control the weather enough to fly. In the vacuum of space, you need absolute climate control, an artificial environment, or a closed world, as architectural historic theorist Lydia Calipoliti has called it. But spaceflight began quite differently, with balloons. The first to actually fly into the higher atmosphere were balloonists. Um, in 1783, the hot air balloon on the right and the hydrogen balloon on the left were invented nearly at the same time. They offered an amazing aerial perspective from, uh, from above for the first time. Initially, the aeronaut projected an image of a bourgeois modern man of science conquering the skies on Rothfeld, often in the company of wine. There are extensive records written about how, how the aeronaut took off, enjoyed a glass of wine, and looked down below to see the magnificent earth. These aeronauts dressed as if for an elegant social gathering, a voluminous dress for her and suits for the two men, all three with hats, which doesn't make much sense up, up in the heavens. These are not the outfits of explorers, but urbanites who brought their social networks and contemplation of their study into the air. Later in the 19th century, meteorologists such as James Glesher paired up with experienced balloonists like Henry Coswell, both pictured here, um, to, in attempts to break altitude records. They sought to understand the upper atmosphere and its effect on the body. In the largest balloon made to date, named the Mammoth, the duo ascended to a record-breaking height of around 36,000 feet in September 1862. Both lost consciousness during the flight and nearly perished. Physiologists like Paul Burr and balloonists also sometimes collaborated to understand what happens to the body in the low pressure environment of the higher atmosphere. Uh, pictured here are three balloonists who worked with Burr but miscalculated how much oxygen they needed to bring up for the flight. In attempting to break an altitude record, two out of the three died. Bird, however, who had remained on the ground, discovered that at higher altitude, the low pressure can support life if there is a higher supply of oxygen. That is, that the quantity of oxygen and the mechanical pressure are related. And this is key, obviously, for space travel. In 1864, the poet Victor Hugo compared the balloon to a helpless cloud floating along in the wind and urged instead the invention of navigable engine flight, akin to a bird. The enthusiasm for balloons gave way to frustration in science as they put into stark relief the fact that embedded in the human desire to fly was the capacity to steer, not merely float along like a cloud. The frustration with ballooning came from not being able to steer them, which was thought to be necessary to put them to any sort of practical, aka profitable, use. The question of what for seemed to fall short of any kind of satisfactory answer. 
Even though they served important purposes in scientific research, they didn't have much of a commercial purpose beyond entertainment. Over time, we understood the uh, need to protect the body from the low pressure to reach be above a certain level. The space suit and space capsule design evolved to allow humans to survive in space, and we got better and better at making enclosed environments that were suited to the human body in space. Experiments like Auguste Picard's in a high altitude pressurized gondola were key to prepare us for space flight to the moon. And in the 1950s, Hermann Oberth's student, former Nazi Werner von Braun, helped prepare Americans for the launch of the space race. Von Braun was a generation younger than the rocket pioneers. He had studied under Oberth in a youth rocket society in 1920s Germany, inspired by Oberth's work. It was called the Space Flight Society. And in the war, in World War II, von Braun had designed the V-2 rocket that bombed London for the Nazis. After the war, von Braun came to the US along with other Nazi engineers to realize his dream of space travel while developing rockets for the US military. He, astronauts like Neil Armstrong, and countless other members of the NASA workforce reference that the influence of the, the influence that the 19th and 20th century sci-fi science fiction had on their fascination with rocketry and space flight from childhood. Throughout the 50s, von Braun pursued other avenues to popularize his ideas of space travel. From 1952 to 54, he convinced the popular Collier's Magazine to produce eight issues that consistently and persuasively made the case for manned space exploration to the moon and Mars within a foreseeable future. Then between 55 and 57, he worked with Walt Disney to create two episodes that were related to space for the Disneyland TV series. The TV series was meant to advertise Disney's new theme park in California, Disneyland, and Von Braun and the animators created entertaining and informative films that explained rocketry as completely feasible and manned space travel as uh, soon to be very feasible as well. These two venues then, print media and TV, served to prepare Americans' imagination for the possibility of space travel. And it worked. In 1949, so before all of this, in a Gallup poll, only 15, 1-5% of Americans thought it was possible that, quote, men in rockets will be able to reach the moon in the next 50 years. That was the question in the poll. By 1955, so after the first Colliers and the first Disney movie, it was 38%. So a huge jump with how much Americans thought it was reasonable to even talk about going to space. At the same time, the US Air Force in the 1950s was carrying out Project Manhai, the first flights to the stratosphere that were aimed at determining the human limits of spaceflight. Three flights sent three men into the stratosphere in one-man cabins between 55 and 58. Manhai 2 flew to 101 and a half thousand feet. Dr. David Simons was in the stratosphere for over 30 hours, breaking altitude records in 1957. They did not go up there with rockets. That was von Braun and the military, and this was the Air Force. Um, the gondolas were aluminum alloy capsules, like a tin can, and the way they did it were with balloons. It was part of the Air Force, US Air Force balloon program. And these balloons were made by Winsen Research Inc., who had pioneered plastic balloons that were lighter and more durable, better able to withstand radiation than previously. Vera Winsen, who was a former artist, was the funder and co-founder of Winsen Research with her husband Otto Winsen. Eventually, and that's him on the, next to her on the right there. Eventually, though, she divorced Mr. Winsen and married David Simons, who had flown in Manhai too. So she is known as Vera Simons. Um, Though not trained as an engineer, during her tenure as Winsen's owner, Vera, then Winsen still, received four patents that included improvements to the balloon's skin, a sealing mechanism, structure and capsule protecting, uh, that protected human passengers and cargo. She was deeply involved in balloon design and manufacturing, as well as in managing the factory workers and the delicate production process. These were often seamstress seamstresses that she called her balloon girls. In 1957, Vera, 
now I think not anymore wins in, obtained a gas balloons pilot's license and became a respected balloonist, a female as a, and a pioneer. And we'll come back to her. Um, and now we'll shift to February of 58, just months before the formation of NASA, the US Air Force continued the spaceflight research of Mannheim with the first ever simulation of a space flight. Chosen for the flight was not a daring pilot like those who had later become astronauts, but a 23-year-old accounting clerk from the base controller's office. His winning characteristic was that he was passive. He was expected to follow directions during the week-long trial in the enclosed capsule, and he could deal with the constant surveillance in the department. So with the new technologies, we see the rise for a new subjectivity. The first spaceman that the US government imagined was not the heroic aeronaut from either the 20th, the 18th, or the 20th century, but this guy. And meanwhile, psychiatrists developed the notion of the cyborg. And they were proposing that we might chemically transform ourselves in order to survive in space. So really gradually taking away the autonomy of the, of the human uh, space person. Cybernetics began imagining the space human again in a system of variables that could be diagrammed, calculated, and most importantly, made to behave predictably. Throughout the 60s, further closed simulations gave rise to questions of habitability. It turned out that assuring mere survival wasn't enough for the humans for long-term presence in outer space. Novelty, the freedom of choice, and meaningful work were all initially overlooked but turned out to be necessary ingredients. It was difficult to realize this in the tiny enclosures. The simulations demonstrated the problems, the struggles with the sending a human body to the moon and later with keeping it alive in space long term. So it turned out that man needs a lot of technology to protect him not only from the vacuum of space, but from his own chemical byproducts. Claude Bernard's 19th century development of the idea of the milieu interior, the interior, uh, milieu, uh, interior atmosphere theories of how we reach homeostasis had always assumed an open exchange with Earth for both resources and for receiving our waste. We have an and a way to absorb our waste. But in the so-called closed life support systems of astronauts who orbited Earth in the Mercury, then Gemini missions, we actually had to rely on the, leak, the capacity to leak human exhaled air, because otherwise, if the capsule is truly closed, the, the, the air would become toxic. But for long-term missions, NASA recognized that they needed to be able to truly regenerate all of the waste into a newly usable matter. And so here we return to this diagram, and I'll tell you that you're seeing the food waste cycle mapped out. So the human system of, of, of eating and, and then creating waste and recycling it. But when structural engineer Rudolf Schillard, together with a Dr. Gom, conducted further simulations of a lunar base and developed a model lunar base in 1959 that you see here, it quickly involved a depiction resembling a suburban small town life, right? When Doug Michaels, a young architect from the collective ant farm, obtained access to Ford Motors archives and found their visions of space-oriented life, those lifestyles too were conservative, despite their futuristic aesthetics. In architecture in 1960, now we're coming to the moment where the two meet, we see a major proposal for a closed world in Fuller and Sadao's uh, dome over Manhattan. Here the focus is on environmental stability, keeping environment out as the most efficient option. And there's little concern with life being limited to the inside of the dome. It basically goes on as usual, but it's in a two mile radius dome in New York City which I guess is a safe assumption that it's a big enough world to keep us entertained. A decade later, Fry Otto, the engineer architect, imagines Arctic City for oil industry workers. Now this is for a maximum of 40,000 workers working the oil there, powered by a nuclear power plant just outside the city. But look at the urban layout. It looks again just like town planning popular in a place like Britain at the time. 
In other words, life in the Arctic under a two kilometer nomadic dome would have the idealized urban typology of a small Western city. In all of these imaginaries, the architectural plan and representational motif belay a very retrograde image. It's exactly the proposed lifestyle of a kind of mythologized small town modernity that young architects were rebelling against in the late 1960s, fueled by people like Marcuse or Lefebvre. In 1947, Laszlo Maholi Nagy had written, quote, art is produced mainly by subconscious organization of the means implicit in the cultural and social setting of the period. In intuitively choosing certain aesthetic or technical problems, the most sensitive and advanced artist is a tool for the recording of the time expressive contents. That is, form and structure denote definite spiritual trends. And I'll just keep going and then tell you more. In 1964, the media theorist Marshall McLuhan similarly observed in a seminal work, Understanding Media, quote, the artist is the person in any field, scientific or humanistic, who grasps the implication of their actions and of the new knowledge in their own time. The artist is the person of integral awareness. So they're both of the time and able to somehow see outside of it. That's what both of these quotes are getting to. And so as frustrated architects embraced this role that had been more commonly ascribed to artists of this kind of all seeing and participating at the same time in one's reality, a lot of the space simulations and research reached the architectural consciousness, the architectural mainstream, in part through architectural journals. So this, note this diagram, it's very different than the earlier diagrams that I showed you of the, the waste and food processing in space. This one is very illustrative. It's meant to reach a visually minded audience and to be digestible by them. So it's meant for the, uh, for the young architects, for example. And it appears in this issue of architectural design um, that is dedicated to space, the entire issue, which is largely uh, written by uh, Buckminster Fuller and John McHale. And this appears in February of 67. Other sections in the, in the publication examine the growing interest in the cyborg um, as linked with cybernetics, for example. Um, they explore NASA's collaboration with universities. Um, and they imagine kind of the whole life cycle of space. The following year, there is the publication on the right, the special issue dedicated to inflatables. Ultimately, NASA conceptualizes, I argue, the life support system as an enlarged system of man plus environment. However, that environment is limited to the interior of the bubble of the spacecraft. Everything outside is hostile. As architects begin to work these ideas, the aesthetics and logics of the space race enter. Here, I want to underscore that those threads receive their unique vocabulary from the space race to pursue states of individual altered consciousness, as well as alternative collective formations. Initially, they too create something like a man plus environment system. Here's one by uh, the, an English artist who is currently in architecture school. He's training to be an architect but who's kind of leaving architecture knowing that he will be practicing art despite his training. And his creative process leads him to call his final output here body environment, very similar. Uh, he's at the University of Sheffield. And the sketches for his thesis project, Space Field, trace this experimentation toward an ever more developing environment. He resists the viewing of a distancing, of viewing a canvas on the wall, on the top right there, he attempts to stand on it to be immersed in a color field, then makes tangible, flowy, amorphous materials like gas, oil, or water in the balloons on the bottom left there, and gradually creates spaces for more and more of the body to inhabit. So here you see just the head. And the final effect becomes this, what he calls a body environment, an inflatable where the physical distance between the art object and the viewer collapses. The body enters and participates with all senses in a kinesthetic experience that involves a single color field, heat, light, and sound. Inside, he's using perfume, music, inflated furniture, weather balloons, projected films, neon tubes, electromagnetic cables, all sorts of things to create this emotional range in an unconventional architecture. And he's deeply influenced by psychology here. His goal is to expand consciousness through visual experience, not through psychedelics or chemicals like the cyborg. 
He treats each sense individually, and the inflatable acts as a kind of extension of one's skin, bringing together under one roof a collection of affects. Other European architects are also thinking about the senses. Here is a Viennese collective, Hausrucker Co., with their mind expander helmet. Um, another group considers the possibility of mobility in a form on the right that strikingly, strikingly resembles von Braun's, this is von Braun on the left, uh, idea for a lunar lander back in 1952. So these two models are fift, 15 years apart. Um, and the founder of Kop Himmelblau, of the image on the right, writes, we founded Kop Himmelblau in May 68. Of course, space flight had an especially important effect on architecture and its realization. The idea of the autarkic capsule and the idea that the spacesuit made the problem of protection obsolete, even in the most adverse circumstances. Then the idea of weightlessness, to be able to move not only on the ground but through space at will, and having the possibility of finding oneself in any position on moving platforms. For architecture, that means being free to experience new possibilities. The design idea propagates architecture that changes like clouds. Mobile skins and, spa and spaces, architecture as light as air. So unlike in space, the inflatable on Earth could afford mobility to, quote, change like a cloud. But a cloud is very different than a spaceship. The astronaut relies on the spaceship being perfectly maneuverable, on being able to reach a most precise landing, like you saw in the beginning, right, with the very, they had, I think, something like 16 seconds of fuel left as they were landing. Very precise. Their life depends on it. Every aspect of flight must be controlled. And these are the controlling devices, plus a whole other set in Houston on the ground. In this way, Kop Himmelblau, the architect's desire, is to make architecture, to make architecture like a cloud, is more akin to the first instrument of spaceflight, the balloon, which floats along like a bird, in, as we heard in Hugo's estimation. As the field of pneumatics comes into focus in the late 1960s, Textbooks on pneumatics, so pneumatic engineering, intended for architects and engineers address this, this leakiness, this capacity to, to be mobile and to shift and to deal with the air, and they compare it to human features. He writes, quote, it is alive and like the human body, needs to retain a specific inherent energy level. This is the inflatable, or pressure level. This it does by means of a continuous air supply. The inflation equipment is the heart of the air supported structure. And if this malfunctions, stopping the air supply, the structure will deflate and slowly die. So as I mentioned before, the new field of pneumatics really emerges in 1967 at the first um, pneumatics uh, conference in Stuttgart. And it's defined by more powerful computers by then and sensors that can now continually adjust air pressure. They can adjust temperature, lighting, all in response to user demands. The inflatable can be blown up or down in response to human whim. So it's less about it responding to natural forces but more about the human uh, desiring inside. And so these are the contours along which Frey Otto launches the Nomadis Conference in 67. And this is just an image of Cedric Price's paper from that gathering. Cedric Price is also writing a textbook on pneumatics at this time. Um, so it comes to kind of be called soft architecture by several people. Uh, Warren Brody is the first, but more notably, more famously, Nicholas Negroponte theorizes soft architecture and the social implications of these responsive environments. In Negroponte's view, which becomes the dominant one, I argue that the relationship between responsive architecture and the human user is unidirectional. The architecture is meant to serve the human subject. I desire it responds. Negroponte articulates this desire for a disposable architecture, um, like the group Archigram works with, as you may have um, encountered. Um, and this is expressive of the individualism driving consumer society in someone like Baudrillard's terms. The nomadic total environment can be tailored to man's unique and changing whims, the ever consumable, consumer-friendly architecture. But artists like Stevens seek the place where control finds its limit where a not wholly predictable dance can take place between the assemblage of air, 
membrane, and subject, each with their own agency. The important distinction is that Earth allows the inflatables to leak, to change shape in response to environmental forces, to pull apart from one structure and join another. Ultimately envisioned for our earthly, human-friendly climate, the focus for architects working with inflatables is on how they engage the environment inside as well as outside the bubble. And here the membrane is not exactly a protective membrane, but a mediating one. And we see that despite their space-inspired forms, these are deeply concerned with an earthly orientation. They're concerned with our relationship to not only the earth, but to breathable air. In light of our first human encounters with the airless vacuum of space, inflatable structures on earth capture air's agency in shaping our environment, something that until now we had more or less taken for granted. Emphasizing this, um, this idea, I want to highlight the last part of this quote, that, they do, that air structures do this by continuous air intake, breathing, and then the last sentence, with this fusion of body and environment, air structures may be seen as living structures, vitalized by human activity. We see air again, and it becomes ontological, an agent with the capacity to form our world. And this is a famous quote by Bantam, the simple windbag um, that continually responds, and it's a partnership relation with the enclosing membrane, each going independently but sympathetically about its business. This idea that the air has a business to attend to. It's not just a recipient of our whims, but it has its own agency and its own action on the world. So after the initial lunar landing, architects of, uh, of, play, of collectives like Ant Farm begin working heavily with inflatables and with the concepts of space travel. They bring the space mythology back to the ground. Living and working in Houston, they become the space cowboys in the grounded enterprise of business relations or survival in a capitalist reality, for better or for worse. Vera Simons, the, the balloon manufacturer turned pilot, now turns to making inflatable art environments with her skill set that she learned from making high altitude balloons. She underscores how their changing forms constantly transform existing space and that they produce an environment. And Andy Warhol does something similar, much more famously. His, his, he's got these floating um, inflatables called pillows, but Vera Simons' inflatables are much more kind of sophisticated technologically and she does them herself instead of with help from engineers. Anyway, Simons becomes a CAVS fellow, the Center for Advanced Visual Studies at MIT shortly after its formation. Um, this is a center dedicated to the relationship between art and science. And there, she begins to translate her ballooning capacities into kinetic artworks. In her artistic flights, balloon flights, she's prioritizing not high altitude and breaking altitude records, but the connection between the atmosphere and the ground. This is the area that the late Bruno Latour will later call the critical zone, from the rocks to the tops of the trees. Her goal is for people to look skyward and recognize that there is a world of interaction possible. And she's also collaborating with scientists. She does projects mapping pollution via balloon and things like this. Along the same lines, Stevens inflatables, Graham Stevens, the, the English architect, artist trained as an architect, um, his inflatables reached skyward to work the atmosphere in the early 70s. In 1974, Desert Cloud, this project, is a large solar balloon developed for the Arabian Desert. At sunrise, the large membrane sits on the ground and fills with gradually warming air as the air expands. During the day, it floats low above the horizon, offering much needed shade in the desert. And as the evening air in it condenses, Stevens can extract potable water from the desert atmosphere. Stevens raises significant funds to reproduce these across desert environments to make deserts basically greenhouses to make that possible. But as tensions rise in the Middle East before the OPEC oil crisis, support falters. Until the last few years, he's currently, today, um, has several commissions to revisit this work from agencies like the European Union. In 1972, Stevens writes, quote, supported by the same material as the medium they float in, so air, the nature of air-supported structures is the same as their environment. 
By harnessing a property of the medium in which we live, our microenvironments are no longer extensions of the ground, but transcend it, like us, and become articulated areas of atmosphere. The relation to our created environment then comes closer to the metabolic system, exchange system that evolved us. With this, Stevens shifts the domain of architecture from being an extension of ground, that is the constructed figure in the dyad figure ground, to an articulated area of the atmosphere. And this is how he brings it closer to the metabolic exchange system that evolved us. So here we can draw a line between Negroponte's view of responsive architecture with the unidirectional goal on the left to efficiently align the environment with user demands and something other, a lively, vibrant ecosystem that extends human capacity to exchange the world. So it's more of a push and pull between the architecture and the human. But it also differs from NASA's notion of man and environment, which had kept the, inside, the outside out, which is the one on the left now. In experimental inflatables, the vibrancy becomes due to a continuous influx of exterior air. The architecture and the outside viscerally leak into the human subject's body. They become one. It illustrates the creation of environmental attunement through atmospheric forces. And we begin to question identity construction, where I begin. Jane Bennett said in a recent talk, quote, once you think about the non-human forces around you and your biome and so on, the whole notion of an identity loses importance. Not even a critique, just less relevant because the non-human factors are also endeavoring, they're also making effort. End quote. This sentiment reflects the overwhelming sense of oneness that astronauts had struggled to express. And we begin to see the agency of the air and the pneumatic form, and we begin to think of the expanded sense of collectivity that the inflatable made possible. So after the first lunar landing, as I mentioned, watched by 650 million people worldwide, each subsequent broadcast garnered less attention. With dwindling interest in watching subsequent lunar landings, the what is it for question that we thought about with ballooning returned. It had been a race, the space race, Americans won, now what? There was no new purpose that was nearly as enticing. And watching the astronauts do lunar science on TV just got old pretty quickly. And there was the difficulty of communicating in words the awesomeness of the astronauts' individual experiences. Words failed. But the view of Earth from space solidified the understanding that humans were relegated to Earth. This is an image that was taken aboard Apollo 17 called the Blue Marble. That's a very famous image. Um, despite our brief sojourn elsewhere to the moon, we really weren't going to be leaving the planet anytime soon. And the 1972 publication on the right there, Limits to Growth, underscored the dangers of that. It warned us of the consequences of our pursuit of progress should, should continue unfettered. We now recognize the limits, the extent of the limits of Earth's resources. In this new post-lunar world, we needed new social scripts, new agendas that didn't rely on progressive ideology if we were going to survive this planet long term. And I mean progressive in the sense of expansionist, growing more and more, more consumption, more use of resources. And this is the key distinction. Inflatables produce space for social experimentation. They produce different ways of engaging not only the materials of so-called architectural enclosure, but each other. These were all collective experiments in cohabiting, cohabiting the planet. Ant Farm used inflatables as field hospitals to stage public protest performances or as hangout lounges at concerts, as you see here. In Antioch College in Ohio, students designed and built an inflatable campus. Students did this, that they then occupied for a year, holding all of their classes in it. And on Ibiza in Spain, students, again, gathered and over the course of three weeks built an inflatable campus um, so that they could lower the cost of attending a design conference in 1971. All of these inflatables operated not as representation, how we normally view architectural models and how NASA view art during its art program, but as ready-made prototypes of altered reality through which a novel system of relations take place. 
An autobiographical ant farm data sheet communicates this in, in maybe better words. They write, quote, ant farms, it's in the black squares there, ant farms' immediate concerns are for expanding environmental awareness and ecological consciousness. The catalyst for interaction is often inflatable structures, but the basic information exchange is at the essence of our commitment to alternate lifestyles. In early 1971, Stuart Brand, the creator of a seminal kind of do-it-yourself technology and mail order uh, whole earth catalog, very famous publication in those years, commissioned Ant Farm to create a mobile facility to produce an edition of his magazine of the whole earth as a supplement. However, this was the saline desert in California where winter temperatures rise over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> the, the inflatable's helplessness against the heat so frustrated Brand that he swore off inflatables for good. He had found their limit. In 1972, the last Apollo mission took place with the planned three last launches, Apollo 18 through 20, scrapped for lack of public interest. Um, by now, the flights were nearly routine and the tasks performed by the astronauts, again, were, were of little interest to the public. That same year, the Osaka Expo took place, a World's Fair, with the most extraordinary inflatable forms on display, as you see one up here, the Fuji Pavilion. On the left here um, is the ECHO, the first US satellite balloon from the 1960s. So that's an older image. ECHO was a 27 meter diameter, 210 degree spherical mirror made of aluminized mylar. And on the right is, from the Osaka Expo, the interior of the Pepsi Pavilion um, that was built by the group Experiments in Art and Technology, uh, a New York-based group with help from Chrysalis, an architectural group in California. Um, and this is a test, an image from a test inflation near LA in California before it was shipped to Japan. The point here is that we can literally trace the influence of the, the space engineering on the inflatable, as this, uh, the one on the right was made with, made by Billy Kluver, the founder of uh, experiments in R and technology, who had been an engineer with Bell Laboratories that made the Echo. So there's literally engineers making both the artistic works by now, and that had made the the um, astronautical works before. So the Osaka Expo has been largely historicized in scholarship as the dying last breath of the inflatable craze. Along with the end of the space race and the OPEC oil crisis, inflatables ceased to be the medium that spoke of architects' concerns. And yet in the mid-1970s, when physicist Gerard O'Neill shifted attention from the moon to space colonies and did a huge push imagining space colonies, Stuart Brand, his good friend of the whole Earth catalog, turned to Ant Farm to reflect on his imagery. Ant Farm member Chip Lord underscored the potency of image making as a way to sell a political and economic vision, leaving the question of for whom was O'Neill's perfectly sculpted society. To this day, imagined Martian habitats resemble the 1970s experiments in inflatables. And mega firms like Foster and Associates are proposing 3D printing over inflatable bases on the moon and Mars. So to close, I want, I want to say that the late Anthony Vidler warned us that Buckminster Fuller's radical ecology remained primarily part of his aesthetic legacy. That ultimately his whole cloth ecological vision was largely ignored and we just remember the, the final visual product. As we turn back to inflatables and in thinking about the upcoming space race, is it merely their formal attributes that we will remember? Or are we going to consider what they were after in terms of new social relations, in terms of the alignment, in alignment between human and machine, and between humans with regard to the environment? Which are the best techno-social models that we have today for exporting to another world? Will we remember the goal of the social experimentation, the communal lifestyle that these architects were after, where there is more freedom of expression, acceptance, and respect among human species and other spe toward other species and each other? Where the inflatable is but a membrane between realms, where it's supported by the most fragile earthly air? Thank you. Question.
questions? Does anybody have any questions, comments? Question? Yeah, Max. Do you think they were successful at the end of the day? Is the impact something that was taken seriously by architecture really? Or is it something that's kind of stayed within the sci-fi realm? Yeah, that's, that's kind of my point, that we certainly remember their form, right? We, we see inflatables. These are kind of familiar images. Even if you haven't seen that one, you've seen one. And, and my point is that there was this whole lot of um, kind of poetic and, and kind of human response to a particular set of questions in time. And I, I, my goal is to kind of keep those questions on the table. You know, what does it mean to be a society on a finite sphere? And, and some of their thinking, some of the, the things that don't get captured is the, the, the cultural experience of living in a society where those relationships are a little bit different. And so that's kind of, I, I don't know if they were successful. I, in part, think that they were, in a way, decades before we had the theoretical apparatus to understand them. So now we have a lot of philosophers writing about thing power or non-human ontologies, the agency of matter. And the, I, on the other hand, we have anthropologists writing about co, uh, coexisting and entanglements between human and non-human. I feel like a lot of those ideas are present here decades before we had the theories to, to verbalize them. So I think that they were kind of prescient in a way. And now we have better tools. We can use all of these new theories and the theory of the Anthropocene to go and interpret those works. So in a way, they, they kind of stay with us and, and they come back and, and become all the more resonant. Thanks. Yeah, great. I, I, guess, what, I guess what strikes me is that that the, the space missions were just technology heavy, mm -hmm. just really surrounded, you know, and that the, the experiments with inflatable, inflatables were like technology free. They had, they had almost no, um, and you know, I, I mean, I think that's a lovely sort of contrast. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I have. I don't think I showed it today, but I have these images of, of um, Archigram has this image of a guy in his underwear laying there in a bubble, you know, just kind of having his best time next to an astronaut, right? And, and the, the approach is the same. The Archigram draws the kind of suiting up and, you know, the guy goes into the bubble, he suits up like a cocoon and then poof, it, it inflates around him. And yet the end result is that, this kind of like loungy hippie guy, right? It's a very different attitude toward technology, toward progress. Um, so, so I like to think of the inflatable as kind of the broken mirror of NASA's like pursuing a very specific goal um, with, with the technological amazing, right, brilliant pursuit um, but they're the kind of at once rejecting it, and yet they're, it's only possible for them to do what they do because they're aware and following what's happening. So it's this really interesting kind of tension. And, and for me, this idea that they leak, right, in the face of the enclosure, the astronaut's enclosure, that necessitates complete sealing, this complete, a complete seal in order to literally stay alive, they really um, exercise the affordance of leaking because they're on Earth. So it kind of underscores their earthly orientation. Um, Ant Farm, I, again, I did not show this image. Uh, I could have talked about this for you know all day. <laughs> I had to make cuts. But Ant Farm, on the morning of the launch of Apollo 11, goes to NASA headquarters with an inflatable and an American flag. And again, a half-naked engineer is standing there. I mean, he looks like a hippie. He's a brilliant engineer. Um, but he's standing there with the flag, kind of saluting, right, in, at 2 in the morning, waiting for the launch of, of Apollo 11, but with this shoddy-looking inflatable. So they, they're very much a part of it. They want to be with it, and yet they're focused on the what does it mean to be on Earth. Right? Only three of us are, two of us will land on the moon. Three of us are up there. What does it mean that we're here? And that's what, I think that's where the productive tension is. Yeah, Daniela. Or maybe a of both. 
I think it's it's probably a combination of both, like that Norman Foster, oh yeah, that one. Um, these projects, they, they did one for the moon, which is this one, and another one for Mars. And what I think that a lot of the, the kind of cutting edge research now is using an inflatable as a, as a form, and then using kind of microwave robots to print with regolith on top of the structures. So once you've printed it, then you can either deflate, you can do whatever you want with, you can pull the balloon out, or if it's sturdy enough, you can leave it there. Um, but the, so the inflatable becomes a means to an end. Uh, but that said, again, I'm, I'm kind of, I, I believe that practically they're, they will remain useful, but my concern was with pushing their original social agenda, right? It's not just the form that, that I think is worth keeping from this period of experimentation, this, you know, five years or so, but what was it that they were imagining a social alternative? Because, you know, images like this inside, they're still kind of imagining these these um, villages, right? These kind of 19th century romanticized villages in a lot of cases. And I think there, there needs to be kind of an update in the social utopia, let's say, vision um, for, for how we're thinking about future, the future of the social relations of space travel. Yeah. Yeah, back there. Yeah. Yeah. I love that question, and um, I'm teaching history too this semester. And in fact, the the very last weeks of class, we will be talking about the kind of debate between architects and engineers of the of the 19th century. So that's you know like a preview, <laughs> but. Um, but the, the question between um, engineers, kind of more practical concerns, and then architects being something plus, right? Is architecture an art or is it a science? Is it engineering or is it, is it visual interest? Um, and I think that what happens in, in space research is that the, as the simulations begin, um, there's a lot of focus on survival, right? Assuring that the person can breathe, that they have food, that they have the, the kind of physiological needs necessary for their survival. But what they learn rather quickly is that, like the guy that I showed you, the, the week-long test, by day like five or six, he gets angry. This very meek kind of, I follow directions, you know, clerk, um, gets angry and starts cursing at the people who are surveilling him and writing angry things in his journal. And they realized through, through that test and then through many others, or a number of others, that um, there is more to survival than just the physiological and the kind of psychology and the social emotional needs become more and more important. And this is, I think, where design shines. The engineers are great at providing for the necessary means of survival and the, the architects are kind of, I, I would guess, and you can argue with me, I would love that, um, but I think are a little bit better equipped to think about the whole wholesome, the, the holistic experience of the human. So what they discover, as my seminar students can help me out here, they discover that you need to have the, the sense of the freedom of choice, that that, you, that having the capacity to choose what you eat makes a really big difference, that you have work that feels meaningful, and so on and so on. So these kind of more existential human concerns have to be met in addition to just the bare survival. And I know that to this day that remains a struggle. There have been tests recently, an architect from Norman Foster was telling me they were doing some tests in the Arctic, remote regions of, of designs for, for this project or for projects like this, and they did a simulation, and when they discovered over, I think it was a few months long, that they discovered that when um, supplies were brought to the people who were isolated, um, they were brought on wooden pallets, right? Big, big shipments of goods brought on wooden pallets. And on a, on a certain trip, someone observed that those pallets, elements of those pallets, had all been integrated into the Arctic station. So they were hanging like art on the walls. They were, they were being used anywhere and everywhere, every last piece of the pallet. And it turned out that the, the Arctic kind of scientists were so hungry for wood. Right, this very man-made, not man-made, this very familiar tactile 
uh, earthly material, because everything there was super shiny and clean and polished and very technological. And people are hungry for the basic familiar familiarity of home. Um, so again, that's something that the architects realized, Norman Foster realized as an architecture firm, rather than the engineers that they had been working with before and the scientists. Yeah, yeah, Max. Yes, and I think that they are just reproducing the kind of model, right? These are largely white, Western, middle class and above men, right? That are reproducing the kind of idealized environment that, that modernism taught us to crave, right? This is an area, a, a period of rapid urban, uh, suburbanization, right? Where urban renewal is happening in the inner city. The inner city is seen as kind of a, a dangerous place, a decrepit place in many cases, and the suburbs are really it. So they're recreating the suburban kind of progressive image that they're used to seeing in the media and their own thinking probably in their own life, right? They're, a lot of them live in places like Texas, which is quite suburban. So they're reproducing their milieu and they don't have the kind of critical apparatus, the urbanists, let's say, slant to understand that this is, this is not just an image to be taken for granted. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah, Henry. Thank you. For me, and I guess for other people in this room, not too many, to look at the landing uh, video again, because it's <laughs> so <sort> of live. <gasps> TV, many, I would love to know more. <laughs> yeah. It was up there, because it was all the produce of propaganda and the whole system to, to show that. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. much, right? uh, the, so the image of the balloon passengers, when it's in the vanity, mm -hmm. the beach, yeah. that were allowed to kind of go up in space, it's the same as the Prada, SpaceX. Yeah, Branson. Mm -hmm. I think that's a, a fascinating and, and valid point and exactly what I'm kind of heading toward thinking about. Um, I, on the, I think the second week, I'm, I'm teaching a seminar on the, the first space race right now and, and its relationship to architecture and environment. And in the second week, we, we examine specifically the, the kind of tension, let's say, between the US civil rights movement and the Apollo 11 launch. And at the Apollo 11 launch, uh, civil rights leaders came and, and in protest the night before and said, this is the fascinating part. Again and again, it is said, we are not against the space race, but we are aware that the US is spending billions of dollars on it. What about us? 
Why is there still poverty in the inner city? Right? Why are kids still starving in a place where we can put Whitey on the moon, right? as the famous poem went? Um, so there was this tension. And yet, every time there was the underscoring, we are not against this. We are excited. We are proud. And there is this tension of how can we not deny our human, infinite human, insatiable curiosity, and yet also have as much curiosity and empathy and compassion and, and desire to change the world, right? So that there is not these issues. And why can't we do both? And I think that as the second space race comes into focus, a, a reason that I'm so interested in these inflatables is because I do think that they have this kind of alternative social agenda that I think is worth experimenting with as a kind of way of engaging the public, expanding the conversation around who is a space race for and how to, how to make it resonate, in a, how to make it a more inclusive process. I don't know what that looks like yet, right? But I think that is the question. How do we make it so that the space race does not feel like an insult to a large uh, sector of the population? Um, and if anyone wants to talk about that, I, I'm all ears, because that's kind of where, where my research is going as, we, as, we, as I kind of get to the present, let's say, and the, the, the launching of a new space race, which is, you know, here practically. Yeah, I love that. I think that's an awesome question because we've we can't even imagine what it would be like to not have Earth as a reference, right? Um, and I think that's such an interesting question. How many generations would it take? Would it be ever possible to lose that that reference point? That oh, if only we could bring a little of this from Earth or a little of that. Um, I mean, in in thinking about space colonies in in the mid 70s, uh, Gerard O'Neill, I showed that that really colorful image of an imagined uh, space colony. Uh, he envisioned uh, trips back and forth. So, and he's got this great letter in his book about uh, space colonists who, after three years of living in orbit, they're, they're on a space station, so they're orbiting, they're not on a planet, they go back to Earth for six months. Um, and so, you know, they see their relatives, they see their friends, their family, and whatnot, but they can't wait to get back because they have their garden, they have their work, they, they like their life in orbit. And so I guess, I guess rather than thinking about the, the kind of urge to go back, the, his focus was more on what would be the pull forward to keep you interested in being in orbit, to make life in orbit as desirable, as enjoyable, and perhaps more so because of the kind of novelty and the open-endedness, because it's unscripted still, right, um, than it had been on Earth. And as far as the materials go, yeah, that's a good question. How long? How, I mean, could we bring and recreate earthly materials or would that desire die down over time as well? The memory of touching wood or sand, you know, um, or leaves or what have you. Yeah, I love these questions. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Very much. Thank you.